On behalf of NCNK, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Esther Im, and I am the program manager of the National Committee on North Korea. Uh, for those of you who are new to us, NCNK is a Washington-based uh, non-governmental organization that works to promote and support uh, principled engagement between the United States and North Korea uh, in order to improve mutual understanding, promote peace and security on the Korean Peninsula, and improve the lives of the North Korean people. Today, we will be taking stock of North Korea's economy and assessing the impact of the COVID-19 lockdown. Um, when we originally conceived of this discussion, we imagined kind of a review of, of the last couple of years with, with a view to the, be thinking about the future and a potential reopening. Um, but with the recent announcement of cases, you know, I think it much, much remains to be seen. Um, so we're really thrilled to be joined here by a distinguished panelist to help us kind of think through these issues. Um, we'll begin with a moderated discussion and then an audience Q&A. So if you have any questions, please um, submit those into the Q&A box. And before I hand it over to our fantastic moderator, I will briefly introduce everybody. Um, first up, we are joined by Dr. Rudiger Frank, who is a professor of East Asian Economy and Society and the head of the East Asian Studies Department at the University of Vienna. He holds an MA in Korean Studies, Economics and International Relations and a PhD in Economics. And in 1991 and 1992, he spent one semester as a language student at Kim Il-sung University in Pyongyang and has been researching North Korea ever since. His research focuses on socialist transformation in East Asia with a focus on North Korea, state business relations in East Asia and regional integration uh, in East Asia broadly. And he has been recognized as one of the most influential German economists. And I'll just note, our, our panelists have much longer bios, but I'm truncating it here and we'll send a, a full list um, in, the, in the chat. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Hazel Smith, who is a professorial research associate at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London and a professor emerita in international security at Cranfield University. And she's also an, an advisory fellow at the North Korea Economic Studies section of the Korea Development Institute in Seoul. She has written extensively on the North Korean economy, sanctions, and humanitarian assistance. And notably, Professor Smith lived and worked for the United Nations Humanitarian Organizations in North Korea for two years, where she earned um, and where she earned a North Korean driving license, which she noted is, is still valid. And last but not least, we have Dr. Darcy Drought, who will moderate our session. She is currently a postdoctoral fellow for the George Washington University Institute for Korean Studies. And she's also a non-resident fellow at the Korea Economic Institute, as well as a non-resident fellow at the National Bureau of Asian Research. A political scientist and foreign policy analyst, Dr. Drought publishes broadly on South and North Korean domestic politics and foreign policy, inter-Korean relations, and U.S.-Korea policy. She holds a PhD in political science from John Hopkins University, an MA in Korean studies from Yonsei University, and an AB with honors in anthropology from Davidson College. So thank you so much for joining us. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to Darcy. Thank you so much. Sure, thanks, Esther. Um, first of all, I'm absolutely delighted to moderate this panel. I really couldn't think of two better, more illustrious scholars who could, who could be talking about these issues. Um, just to kind of set the stage a little bit, what we've asked the panelists to do is to talk about how over the past two years, the, the, the unintended, perhaps the unintended consequences of the border shutdown um, that North Korea has, has had um, in place since COVID. Certainly in the early, you know, for, for a while, it seemed that the border shutdown seemed like a, a, a positive thing for as far as um, the spread of the virus. Um, as though, as we know, um, it also meant the trade of, uh, cutting off the uh, uh, networks of trades of goods, uh, movement of people, um, you know, we have some reports about the, the effects on their economy, but I'm, I'm sure our panelists are going to talk about uh, you know, the issue of data availability is one that we're, we're having to grapple with. Um, and then certainly more recently, um, with the incidences of COVID going up in North Korea, that's really, you know, shaking how we're, how we're going to be assessing the future of North Korea's economy. And so I'm not going to say, I'm not going to do much else um, except, you know, you know, say that the kind of main questions that I'd, I'd like to you know make sure our panelists hit on is how has North Korea fared under the lockdown? Um, what's been its socioeconomic impact? I think the intersection of politics, society, and economics are, are two of our panelists' strong points, and I think that's something 
that I, I, I hope that we bring out a little bit. And then finally, what does it look like um, in the future when trade is resumed? Um, so I'll just go ahead and, and turn it over to Dr. Frank first, who's gonna set up some of the more um, long er, bird's eye trends. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this very flattering introduction. Although being called uh, distinguished always makes me feel old, so probably you shouldn't be doing this. Um, and of course, I also uh, appreciate the opportunity to share some of my thoughts with you here uh, with the very distinguished audience, actually, uh, as I could see from the invitation list. Now, um, my take uh, on the whole issue in eight minutes, um, I wonder what I'm going to do for the other five. Um, to start with the uh, sources, which I think is a major issue when we talk about North Korea's economy, we need to be aware or just remind ourselves continuously that uh, all we have in terms of real information on North Korea are data points, um, uh, not really systematically collected uh, databases, and that these data points are available randomly. That is, uh, we are forced to work with what we get not with what we need and our research is therefore inevitably biased and in fact that would be a situation that would hardly be acceptable for any academic discipline but then again that's the reality we have to deal with so what data points do we usually have and what is kind of informing my assessment of all these issues that you have just mentioned um, well the one group would be like quantitative information uh, we have trade data um, coming through COTRA, the South Korean Trade Investment Promotion Agency, but actually mainly originating from Chinese customs. That's where they get it from. And that, of course, inevitably raises the big question of how much do we trust the Chinese customs to publish uh, the truth and or all they know on their trade with North Korea, because 90% of North Korea's trade is trade with China. Um, we have budget data from North Korean media, you know, that I annually publish a short uh, report on this on 38 North uh, during the uh, Supreme People's Assembly session. They publish some figures, no absolute numbers, usually growth figures, and I use that as a proxy for GDP. We have market price data from sources like Daily NK or Im Jin Gang. Um, that is based more or less on anecdotal evidence, but they do it systematically, and we have some figures. And of course, we have a source that Hazel has been working with a lot, and I know she emphasizes that this should be used more. It's international organizations and NGOs. The problem is that as of 2022, few of them, if any, actually are present in North Korea, and also their access uh, level has been diminishing over the past years. Then, um, in addition to this quantitative inf information, we have qualitative information coming from visits. Uh, I've been a frequent visitor to North Korea until uh, before COVID. Um, this is no systematic research, but at least you're there and you can you can get some some anecdotal evidence. Um, in a similar vein, we have embassies, like if you wish permanent visitors with a very limited um, access to the country, but still they are there. Uh, but now many of the embassies have been closed and those that are still there, they don't really talk to us. Um, then we have defectors as a major source of qualitative information. <clears throat> One problem is that they usually do not come straight from North Korea into uh, our um, conferences or whatever we have or into publications. Sometimes they go through China or elsewhere. And the numbers have just been dropping. I mean, in 2019, we still had somewhat over 1,000 uh, defectors from North Korea. In 2021, that number was down to 63 per year. Uh, so from over 1,000 down to 63. And I just looked it up. Uh, the, as of March of 2022, we had 11 North Korean defectors. And then again, doesn't mean that they all left in 2022. So also that source, especially in understanding what's going on right now, is kind of of limited value. Um, we have North Korea state media reports. Um, we have some pretty interesting new level of detail and kind of regular reporting on COVID numbers apart from the question of whether we trust these figures, but it's pretty unusual for the North Koreans to publish any kinds of data. And uh, yeah, then we have some uh, other sources, but they're also all pretty much random and uh, occasional. So um, how do we assess the impact of the lockdown based on this? Um, 
does it mean we cannot access the impact of the COVID lockdown in North Korea at all? Well, I would say no, of course we can uh, assess it, um, but we must be aware of the limitations of such an attempt. And that was the whole point of the first part of my few remarks here, that we really need to be very careful. A useful tool, I think, to navigate these pretty shallow waters is what I like to call common sense. There can be a fancier term for that. But what I mean is a combination of a long-term understanding of the workings of the North Korean economic system, because that doesn't change so fast. Our knowledge about the most recent status based on those available data points that I mentioned. Um, and all this filtered and seen through the prism of uh, experience, which is many things, including another word for a huge number of errors that have been made in the past, some of them my own errors, some uh, errors that I observed others um, making. So, you know, you learn from experience, you learn from your misinterpretations, and then probably, hopefully, um, you will be a bit better. Now, on the first item, the North Korean system, in a way, since 2005, and especially since Hanoi 2019, we do notice a return to more state, less market, to put it in a, in a nutshell, and to more autarky and less trade. Uh, so this is not a COVID-related event. The North Koreans have been doing that before. Uh, they have been trying to drive back uh, whatever they had in terms of a market economy, and they had been focusing on import substitutions. We know that from uh, speeches by Kim Jong-un uh, at the party congress and his annual talks um, at the beginning or the end of the year, uh, and then all these follow-up events. So that's a pretty solid information we have in terms of how the system has actually developed. On the second item is the data point. We do notice a dramatic decline in trade. Uh, of course, the damaging impact of sanctions and also very low economic growth rates. If you look at the last two decades in terms of trade, North Korea's trade volume was actually the highest in 2014 with about $7.5 billion exports and imports combined. Um, trade has declined ever since. And in the first COVID year of 2020, it crashed from uh, it crashed to 0 0.8 billion. So from 7.5 billion in 2014 to just 0 0.8 billion in 2020. And um, 2021 wasn't much better either. Now uh, you mu must have read it recently in April, 2022, Chinese customs. Mm -hmm. reported a mild rebound in North Korean exports to China from 57 million to about 100 million dollars. Um, but uh, if you multiply those 100 million by 12, so for a year you would still have just one third of uh, 2014. So trade is still pretty much down. Um, just briefly on growth rates, um, as I said, I used the North Korean state budget for that. The official plan, the official plan, like this is what they tell their own people. You would usually assume that they, they try to kind of beautify numbers a little bit. The official plan is less than 1% growth. So that is actually very, very low, especially for a country like North Korea, as opposed to double digit rates that they published in the same source in 2005 and still 9% in 2012. The Bank of Korea, of South Korea, has much worse numbers actually estimating negative growth rates, but also from that angle, it doesn't really look very good. So overall, this means that North Korea is very badly situated to mitigate an additional external short-term shock or crisis, such as COVID and also a COVID lockdown. They have very few reserves. I mean, even whatever they have must be depleted at some point, and they've been in crisis for a long time. And uh, we all know, and that's our systemic understanding, that a state-dominated economic system ruled by a bureaucracy is just not efficient and not flexible enough to handle such a thing properly. Uh, what is curious is that much of the trade implosion of the last two years is based on the initiative of the North Korean side. So for sanctions, you could argue this has been forced upon them, but they closed themselves off from China more or less deliberately, which I find interesting because it could be an indicator that the situation isn't as bad as we assume or it could be something else. I mean, here we talk about North Korea and we speculate. In any case, um, some other problem is that uh, the lockdown happened in May. Uh, that is uh, the rice transplantation time, which is actually when all offices and universities in North Korea get empty and people are carried out to the countryside, to the fields to help in this rice transplanting. Uh, very labor intensive. So if you have a fever, it's actually very hard to work out there. Like right? It's not like in an office where you're 
get some ibuprofen and then you you're functional so um in a nutshell i think uh, we can assume that the harvest of 2022 will have been affected one way or the other by the covid outbreak and also by the lockdown itself in other words we might see something like a food shortage uh in winter and the numbers are pretty grim we have uh, 3.8 million north koreans according to official north korean figures who have been affected by omicron so um yes well we we don't know whether it was omicron but they said so on may 12 but they have tested only 64,000 people that's why they keep talking about the fever so um yes significant parts of the north korean workforce have been unable to perform their duties in agriculture food shortage as an inevitable result. Uh, what's the obvious solution? Well, imports of food and um, low trade figures, as I mentioned them before, suggest that they have nothing to pay for such imports of food. Plus it will be very difficult to do so anyway because of the sanctions. But this is when actually China and Russia and the new situation after the Russian invasion in Ukraine come up as pretty interesting options for a totally changed situation here more or less you could see light at the end of the tunnel at least from pyongyang's perspective um, on a side note if you look at the latest uh, im jin gang data on prices in north korea it's actually remarkable that between april 1 and may 27 so before and after the lockdown prices for gasoline diesel rice corn renminbi and us dollars have actually remained relatively stable we see moderate increases but no dramatic increases so if this data is correct then obviously the markets are not overreacting which means that the situation is still stable um you know i've written on 38 north just a few weeks ago about the end to sanctions as we know them and as if to confirm this a week later uh, on May 26, both Russia, which was expected, and China, which was not so clear, vetoed a UN Security Council resolution against North Korea, um, which means that they have changed their policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis that country. The uh, ability of North Korea to pay for food imports, which would be by revenue generated through exports, will matter less if um both beijing and moscow will see a political utility in supporting north korea um if i'm right and said the sanctions regime as we know it is dead, then north korea might actually even be able to generate revenue through exports by selling to china and russia if they decide not just to veto further sanctions but also to disregard existing sanctions um i'm following russian media closely benefiting from the fact that i also read uh, russian and i uh, found it noteworthy that moscow has been stepping up what they called an anti-western alternative or alliance um it's can be expected they will try to include north korea and so in a way we are back to the 1950s 60s 70s 80s here where they've done something similar and where north korea was able to really benefit from this so to conclude um, all this could lead to the somewhat ironic situation that despite a worsening economy and a looming for food shortage due to COVID and the lockdown, the North Korean leadership will actually be more confident than it was before February 24. And uh, it will again probably be able to model through because of the totally changed geoeconomic and geopolitical situation. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Frank. I think your initial warnings, or, or rather uh, sketching out the contours of how we understand data in North Korea is something that's really sorely absent, I think, in a lot of these hot takes about North Korea. So I, I, I hope that's something that we can all uh, take in mind going forward. So I'm going to um, next turn the floor to Dr. Smith. Okay, thank you very much. And, and like Rudiger, I would like to thank um, the committee for inviting me and I feel very privileged to be in front of what I see from the participants are some very very experienced people in North Korea so I, I will ask forgiveness first uh, for those that uh, know very well some of the things that I'm going to talk about uh, but nevertheless go over some of the ground that Rudiger talked about but also focus on food security at the end of my discussion I've got eight or ten minutes which is not a long time for an academic as you all know um, and I will focus first on um, these try to keep focused on what I was asked to talk about, which is uh, developments since the COVID uh, lockdown of uh, 
January 2020, which is a very, very short time scale, but I will try to focus on what, what I can see in 2020 and 21. And I'll start by saying that I'm drawing on work that's been done at, over the last couple of years by my colleagues at the Career Development Institute, uh, all of which is going to be published in English and put on their website uh, over the next few months. Um, so to, to, to just to, to start, to, to go very quickly, um, as Rudiger's pointed out, the, the economic context uh, overall uh, of these last two years is shaped by two very major external shocks, and it's worth repeating what they are. Um, the expansion of UN sanctions in 2016 and 17, so that sanctions no longer distinguish between the military and the civilian economy, the nearest we've had to comprehensive sanctions since the Iraq and Haiti sanctions of the 1990s. And specifically, those sanctions uh, in terms of the, uh, the in inhibitions on the development of the North Korean economy included a ban on all North Korea's major exports, um, banning of key imports, including machinery, vehicles and natural gas, and severe restriction on oil imports. And of course, it's worth noting that North Korea, unlike other countries which are sanctioned at the moment, is not an oil producer. So that's the first big shock, which is still with us in terms of its impact on the economy. And the second, of course, the border closures um, themselves are from early January 2020. Now, overall, and again, this is the context, despite the smuggling that you always get with any sanctions episode ever in history, um, these major external shocks have not been ameliorated. This is a broad message by countervailing economic tendencies, although and these, there are countervailing economic tendencies. Um, it looks uh, like uh, North Korea is increasingly finding it possible to sell its coal, for instance, when it shouldn't be doing, um, and, and getting reasonable prices for it. But overall, my, my view is that, the, that these external shocks are so big that they, that they haven't really been got round by, by smuggling or other, other um, mitigating measures by the government. Uh, KDI, in broad terms, um, considers that the DPRK has been in economic recession in 2022 for now six years. So let's go to the COVID lockdown, which I was asked to talk about specifically. And I think we should differentiate here. There are two aspects of this. First of all, there are the, the border closures, which stop foreigners and trade and everything else. And secondly, accompanying those, although it's not a direct linear relationship, were the internal restrictions, uh, which have taken place um, not all together, but in different points of time in different regions uh, uh, over the period, but have been significant. And they include travel restrictions, uh, increasing domestic surveillance, uh, increasing use of mass, the tried and tested North Korean tactic when it doesn't have economic resources of mass mobilization, but also a suppression of market mechanisms, including uh, through what KDI has called a de-dollarization policy in 2020 and 2020. 21, and, and the very well recorded now attempt to replace monetary and economic incentives with rewards from ideological exhortation. These are completely impossible, but that, that's been the attempt, especially with the youth, to try to do this. So first of all, it, it, if we look down at the different aspects of the, uh, of the economy over the last uh, couple of years, this, this time focus I've been given, um, it's, it's important. The easiest thing to look at really is trade, because we, although the statistics, as, as really quite rightly points out, are not going to be completely accurate, they're, they're more available to us than other internal statistics. Um, but in that context, even before we look at the trade stats, we should really be careful to note that DPRK trade overall is extraordinarily low by any measure, whether you're looking at trade volumes or whether you're looking at trade per capita, for example. Um, in 2019, for example, uh, North Korea had the lowest per capita export rate in the world at $12 per head. So again, we have to be careful that when we're looking at changes over small periods of time, which I'm going to show in the screen in a minute, what's happened over the last two or three years, this means changes within already minimal trade levels. And remember, this is an industrial country, so it, 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 this, is, uh, this, this, this is an important context. Now I want to, because uh, I'm I'm can be ideologically challenged. I want to try to bring up um, something to share uh, a video to to share a uh, 
a um, to share screen. Somebody's going to have to help me with this because I can't find it on the on the um, on the on the machinery. Anybody help? Share screen. Um, go to the bottom, the bottom bar, yeah. and then it'll be between chat and record. There'll be share screen with a little arrow. Nope, it's nope. not. Chat, share screen. Okay. I'm so sorry about this. I, 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 I really apologize. Is it up? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so if we look at um, this first, what I want to note here is that what this shows is, um, as you would expect, uh, decreases in imports and exports. The blue shaded is imports, the red hatched is exports, the black line is the trade deficit. Now, of course, that's no surprise. You'd expect to see after sanctions of 2016-17 uh, a, a decrease in, in, um, in trade overall. But what's notable here is the differential pattern regarding exports and imports. Export volume, of course, diminished very rapidly after 2017, the first year of implementation of the of the um, UN sanctions from 2018 onwards. But what's also interesting is that you don't see evidence of the government trying to pull back imports uh, in order to, because its export earnings are going down, so it, it's obviously going to have less money to buy uh, imports. So 2018, 2019, you've still got a relatively high level of imports within this overall framework. There's some, I mean, we can only speculate about why that is, but one of the reasons could be that in 2018 and 19, we'll remember the, the Trump summits uh, in Singapore and Hanoi, the, the North Korean government could have had some confidence that in fact, these um, export limits were going to be temporary. But it's not until 2020, when we see the COVID restrictions being implemented, that we start to see um, these uh, reductions in imports. So, so I think this is interesting to see the, the different, uh, the, the, that it's not, a, it's not a simultaneous effect that taking place. We've got dif differential uh, impact or differential outcomes in terms of imports and exports. Now, in terms of the overall, and again, these are KDI figures, give or take, um, even if they're not accurate to the, uh, to, to the penny, they show, I think the trends are worth showing, is that, and again, given that North Korea-China trade for the last few years is basically a synonym for North Korea's trade with the entire world, we can see that uh, trade falls off a cliff from 6 billion in 2016 to 320 million in 2021. And we can see that those rates go down, particularly in 2020, after the COVID uh, uh, implementation, quarantine implementation measures in early 2020, still going down in 2021. I, I couldn't find the update economic growth rate overall for 2021, but I think we can assume that that minus 4.5 here of 2020 has probably not been followed by, well, will not have been followed by an uptake in 2021. So overall, we see that at least on these official figures, and I take into account that, um, that they're certainly not comprehensive because they don't take into account informal trade, we're seeing the economy not in a good shape at all. So we see here that COVID, uh, there's a correlation, we can't say it's co with causation. We haven't got enough, uh, we haven't got enough uh, evidence uh, or, or analytical points to, to, to make that. Uh, conclusion, but we see that correlationary, in correlation terms, that we really start to see in 2020, after the implementation of the COVID uh, measures, um, a, a real uh, deterioration in the economy. And what these COVID measures did was they disrupted all aspects of the economy, not just trade. Um, we see that uh, actually for those Americans who may have been wanting to visit ever as a tourist, which I think has happened, which has happened in the past, or or any uh, anybody holding dollars going, if you were able to get into North Korea in 2021, 20 that the value of the dollar and the yuan, uh, that the RMB decreased against the North Korean won. Again, an interesting phenomenon. 
Um, we also see from 2020 with these fluctuations in market prices internally in North Korea, including a fall in petrol and diesel prices, partly because industry was being decimated because it wasn't getting inputs and capital and intermediate goods and raw materials, uh, but also because uh, uh, possibly the North, the North Korean government de-dollarization measures were making it actually very difficult to spend uh, foreign currency in North Korea. So you have these disruptions in market prices, you had disruptions in trade, you had disruptions in, uh, in, in all aspects of the economy that coincided, that correlated with these, particularly with these, with these COVID restrictions. Um, I'm trying to go quick because I've only got eight minutes. What, what else happened? We have trade, we have manufa in manufacturing. Uh, North Korean industry is import dependent, even though the North Korean government tells you it isn't even though the North Korean government's policy for 70 years has been to try to um, substitute the capital and inputs it needs by labor, which is why you've got a chronic labor shortage throughout the entire economy. Unlike China, for example, when it had the transition to, to marketization, uh, when China had surplus labor. And again, this is very, very important for thinking about North Korea's economic context. You have chronic labor shortages throughout the economy. And you can imagine if COVID is really spreading in the economy right now, uh, that this is going to be a problem, uh, even, even cause ma major, further major problems. So manufacturing, which depends on intermediate uh, goods, things like plastics, et cetera, uh, for, uh, for, for, for its operations, both heavy manufacturing and, um, and light manufacturing declined substantially in 2020 uh, and according to KDI's research didn't decline substantially further in 2021 but that was partly because it was at such a low base level already. Now what about the government's response to all of this? Um, well one thing to say is that state and governmental capacity as far as we can see has not collapsed so it would be a mistake to assume that because the economy is in really, really bad shape, that state and governmental capacity has not collapsed. There's really not the evidence for that. Um, in 2021, um, the government uh, seemed to be undertaking a series of domestic stabilization, stabilization measures. Um, again, just to repeat it, it's, it's only real instrument over the past several years, and this has been the case for some time, in mass mobilization, and it's repeated this again in 2021. Its focus is on disease prevention. And again, one of the things that we, we should remember about North Korea is it's got a very, very, very good public health prevention capacity. And that has maintained itself in terms of the public health organization in North Korea. Up until last year, North Korea's vaccination campaigns coverage was higher than in the United States. For a, on, on basic vaccines, measles, polio, diphtheria, et cetera, and have been for some time, um, which is why in 2019, WHO was able to say that North Korea was measles free. Sadly, last year, WHO thinks that vaccination will have fallen by half, partly because of the COVID measures. This is a very, very big change in North Korea. But nevertheless, it has got a very good public health prevention mechanisms. Um, in terms of these stabilization measures that are that these less ambitious measures, which the government seems to be going for in 2021, early 2022, is it's now saying, pointing to very small visible uh, achievements such as new homes in Pyongyang, new homes in Komdok in South Hamgyong. Um, it's encouraging, again, it's more a question of degree, it's always done this, uh, self-reliance at the regional level, and actually during the famine, this is one of the reasons that society survived. It was resilience from the bottom rather from the top. Um, and it's encouraging competition between regions, between economic entities, although my view is that, that it's hardly, uh, with, without the inputs, it's hard to see how that is going to increase output. And of course, it's trying to very, very consistently replace market values, which are now embedded throughout the whole of the North Korean economy and society uh, with, the, with the values that, it, that it's uh, professes to hold from the Kim Il-sung days. Um, what does all this mean? And again, I'm having to jump really fast uh, uh, to, to different topics in, in order to keep within my eight minutes. What does this mean for agriculture, food and markets, for food security? Well, uh, there's a 26 million population in North Korea. It's not a small country. And the majority, unlike some other countries, depend on domestic food production to survive. 
um, and domestic food production collapsed. Uh, collapse is too strong a word, but it collapsed in terms of its ability to feed most of the population in 2018, and it has not recovered. And of course, we all know that imported food prices have soared. Um, this is something, this is from something that I've put together for, for a piece that I've done recently, um, which I hope might give some uh, idea of how domestic food production, uh, the trends in domestic food production over the last few years. Um, that line at the top, in the top uh, graph, sh it, that's the level of demand to feed North Korea's 26 million people at the absolute basic level of input of 1,700 calories a day, providing there was equal distribution, which of course there never is in any society. And what you can see there is that, uh, and, and the, the orange and the yellow uh, columns are the two most reliable sets of figures we have, uh, which come from the, from the Food and Agriculture Organization and also from South Korea's Rural Development Association. There's issues regarding the 1920 stats, but nevertheless, the trend shows that uh, since 1718, that there basically hasn't been enough food produced in the country to feed the population, it's simple. But more importantly, I think, and what shows the, the problems facing the North Korean government and the North Korean population, more importantly, is the graph below. Although these figures only go up to 2019-20, you can see that the food gap, if you look at 1920, the last figure, the top right-hand figure in that of 1,500, it's um, one and a half million tonnes. Now that's an enormous gap. It's enough to feed more than 8 million people uh, for a year. And you can see that the orange line, which is total commercial food imports, and the food aid, which is the black line at the bottom, which is hardly rises above zero, show that there is an enormous food gap between domestic food production availability and what is coming in through commercial food imports and also through food aid. And that's the problem. That is the food gap, which is the problem. And that continues as food production has, domestic food production has not got back to its pre-sanctions levels. Um, now, food gaps, of course, in any country can be filled from imports and they can be filled from food stocks. Um, it's likely, however, in North Korea, again, this is speculation, which I don't like doing, but given the logic of the situation, it's likely that household food stocks were pretty much exhausted by 2021. And it would be reasonable to assume that government food stocks are probably pretty depleted by now um, after these years, particularly the last two years of COVID lockdown. Now, we know that in 2019, there were very major grain imports, both on concessional and non-concessional terms from China. That was the year that President Xi, uh, Xi Jinping visited North Korea. There was fertilizer aid, there was food aid. We, we, we know that there were some imports from China in 2020, uh, but as far as we can tell that in 2021, there were no food grain imports from China. Now I've been looking at that figure, but that's what KDI found and um, uh, uh, there may have been uh, there may have been non-official imports, which there probably were. But in terms of the scale of the gap, which is a million tons, which is a large amount of food, uh, we would expect to see some grain imports showing in the trade stats if there had been reasonable amounts of grain coming in, either on paid terms or non-paid terms, in 2021, such as to fill the food gap. And there's not much evidence of that. Um, and also the other alarming. Issue is that if we look at the foodstuffs that were imported from China in 20 and 21, and these forget the top two, top two are synthetic fibers and plastic products, but the bottom flour, sugar, and soybean, these are items which have been imported from North, uh, into North Korea in the past in order to go into processed foodstuffs, basic noodles. Um, uh, some basic food production, even plastics are going to, all this is, all these products are, are for light industry. But if we see, if we look to the right hand, uh, right hand column, we find that flour, there's zero imports in 2021. 
We found that we found that sugar imports have gone down by 88% on the previous year, and soybean oil by 91%. Uh, now that's alarming because uh, some of the products, the byproducts of um, of a harvest that can't be used or that are not used in direct grain in direct uh, grain distributions are used in processed food. But you also need other you need machinery, you need oil, you need all sorts of, you need, you need things in order to produce food. So if the raw materials are not there, then you can't either, you can't produce sufficient processed food either. So all in all, um, what we can see, I think, in North Korea are not the same conditions as we saw in the 1990s when famine occurred in North Korea, but pr the preconditions of starvation in North Korea. Um, the, the savage decline in trade since 2017, the decline in domestic food production for a population that relies on domestic food production, um, the reduction in vaccinations last year, which will feed through particularly for children and women, we will see higher numbers of women dying from terrible anemia related problems in pregnancy and birth because of the inability to, to get the vaccinations that they need. The overall poor nutrition, uh, which is an inevitable and logical uh, 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 impact of um, reduced food. And, and again, this is not speculation. This is, this is an analytical conclusion. Um, and, but we will see also that, because we see it already, that there'll be a differential impact uh, when we start to see starvation and malnutrition, well, when we, of the impact of expand, uh, increased malnutrition and, uh, and undoubtedly starvation in some groups of the population. For instance, we already know through the social indicators that we have available to us that rural populations are worse off than urban populations in North Korea. Uh, we know that if you're a frail elderly who live in a residential uh, uh, a complex because your family is un unable to help you. Um, if you live in any residential home because your family is unable to help you uh, there and you rely completely on the government, then you will be vulnerable because the food, food coming into you and, and medical support and heating in the winter is not going to be reliable, um, combined with inadequate access to water, sanitation, medicines, uh, then a different groups, vulnerable groups are going to be at risk. Now, I deliberately haven't talked about 2022 because uh, the last two months there's been some opening and shutting of railway links with China. So we will, we will, uh, if trade does open again, and if marketization does renew itself in North Korea, uh, then we will have different uh, frameworks for analysis. But given, given what I was given to talk about, which is 2020 and 21 up until about now, um, I, we can only conclude by saying that, that, that it's, it, it's bleak indeed, but it's it, for, for North Koreans. Uh, but, but, uh, and and uh, we, we, should be, we should be thinking about the extent of, of what that means for the most vulnerable in North Korea. Great, thank you so much. I think that those details really provide, help us provide, ground what we're thinking about when we think about what we say, um, how is North Korea's economy faring? How is um, its agricultural sector in particular failing, right? Um, just to kind of, uh, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and move into the Q&A. If you have um, questions, uh, please enter them in the Q&A. It should be between, on the bottom between um, polls and participants. I think there's a little, um, I see that uh, Dr. Frank has already answered some of the questions, but I'm going to integrate them into, in, into bundles, you know, as just to kind of, you know, summarize or pick out some of the major themes that I heard in both of your presentations. The first thing that I heard um, is there's like kind of this tacit uh, comparison to what happened in the 1990s, what happened in the arduous march, right? Um, and uh, there are a couple questions about this uh, in the Q&A. Joe Fippen brought up what, in terms of economic figures, how does COVID compare with the hardships? And then what about the, the impact on ordinary Korean lives? 
what I kind of wanted to, and, and, and Dr. Frank answer, uh, you know, answer the, in the Q&A, which you can see, um, that the, the crisis in the 1990s was worse. What I was hoping to, to, to prompt our panelists to, to, to think about, um, I got from both your presentations that the state is strong. I think, um, as Dr. Frank put out, it's uh, more state, less market, more, con or more autarky, less trade. And so I was wondering if, if we think about this in a, in a broader historical perspective, what has Kim Jong-un done differently? What might he do differently um, in this particular uh, period of, of, as Dr. Smith mentioned, mass impending mass starvation that we're going to see in the coming years? How is Mike, can, what tools does he have? How does the state strength um, matter when we think about both, in, both state control, where the state is going, how does it, it relate to the economy on the one hand? And then two, how does that mean, for, what does that mean for everyday North Koreans? What does that mean for the kind of market uh, coping mechanisms that, that people developed in the 1990s? How is that different now? So let's start with Dr. Frank and then we can um, go to Dr. Dr. Smith. Well, it, I mean, that, that's the problem with uh, reality. It, it's rarely black and white. It, it's various shades of gray. And uh, we could easily come up with arguments why now it's easier to cope with the crisis. But we could, on the other hand, have many arguments why it's now harder. To start with the latter, uh, I mean, you now have a middle class in North Korea. Um, that is much more ambitious and they will react much more sensitively to shortages. Whereas when I was there in 1991, it was really like a very homogeneous mass of, of the people at the bottom and they, they, they you know, were also not pretty well informed. That's the other point. The level of information available in North Korea, thanks to a myriad of factors, be it mobile phones, but also uh, the markets themselves, which facilitate lots of people to people exchanges in the country where usually people have been kind of cut off from each other from county to county. Uh, this is not really helpful for um, an uh, autocratic system to remain pretty stable. On the other hand, as you mentioned, and as I also wrote in the chat, um, they have gone through that super heavy crisis in the mid 90s. And Hazel um, has argued that uh, especially this cutting off of oil exports from Russia or Soviet Union to North Korea actually was a, was a major factor leading to a food crisis. And that was pretty much un unexpected. Um, they've gone through that and they learned from it. And um, they had all these coping strategies from decentralization of electricity production to uh, using canals rather than electric pumps for irrigating the fields to focusing more on the domestic production of fertilizer however clumsy that was but they they found ways to kind of localize uh, much of what they did and make it less dependent on external inputs the other thing is i think i also wrote that in the chat um the um the willingness of moscow and beijing and i mean until recently we just focused on beijing but now moscow also has to be mentioned the willingness of those two to support north korea has just increased uh, significantly and in the mid 90s it was basically non-existent both wanted to be nice uh, members of the international community and they wouldn't certainly not want to risk uh, that image uh, in the interest of a country that they really don't care about. I mean, they still don't care, but now the situation is different. And now it all becomes a matter of principle, right? And uh, supporting North Korea is something that you can do to annoy the Americans, which um, they obviously like doing now, which they didn't want to do 30 years ago. So, you know, the whole situation is a very different one. Um, and um, as I also wrote, and that's my last remark on this, we will have to see the outcome of that because again, you have factors pro and con and we, we still do not know what the balance is going to be. I am relatively optimistic that it will be positive from the perspective of the North Korean regime and also in a way from the perspective of the North Korean people, they will certainly suffer. And that is something that we should really be concerned about. Um, I do not yet see um, a very high probability of another mass starvation and the million plus uh, deaths uh, from famine or something, which doesn't mean that there won't be people dying. But uh, the, the, the sad truth is that this is happening in North Korea anyway, due to malnutrition and to many other factors. So, yeah. Um, Dr. Smith, if I could ask you to, to kind of take a, a, another tact on this question is, uh, 
Um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of trying to collate these comments. Um, Brad Babson asked, how do you expect assess the impacts of these development on Don, Donju and their present role in the private capacity, right? Um, Dr. Frank brought up the issue of the middle class and the Donju are, are kind of ersatz entrepreneurs who, who make a lot, in a sense, the modern North Korean economy work. Um, and, and they've been able to step in between the state and, and you know, market economy. So I wonder is how, how does that affect um, both in terms of the decentralized economy versus its central role now? And how is that going to be playing out in the next, uh, you know, as these networks, social, financial goods networks are deteriorating? Um, I, can I answer that, but also come back to food and agriculture as well, one or two points. Is that all right? Okay. From what I can see, I've seen some contradictory evidence regarding uh, over the last two years about what's happening to the Dongju, for a better name, although it's quite a complex social phenomena um, with different levels of wealth involved. Um, there does seem to be evidence that however the North Korean government's doing it, whether through blanket bans or whether through uh, simply making marketization harder uh, because, of, because of transport and movement restrictions, uh, that it's very, very, it's become much harder to spend and use foreign currency in North Korea, which, which um, was the the grease that wheel the the Dongjus and the and the market mechanisms uh, in North Korea. There's also some evidence that they may that that um, that people who ha had foreign currency and quite a lot of people have had foreign currency, but you know, by Dongju we're talking about people who've been able to accumulate foreign currency were hoarding foreign currency on the basis that the situation might be temporary and they might be able to use it. Um, that, that's, uh, that, that's, that's one, one side of it. Um, so that would indicate, that side of it would indicate that they were restricted in terms of their ability to, uh, to maintain their wealth, uh, to, to spend the money on the things that they needed, certainly to import and export, they were, they were restricted. Uh, which would have had some impact on maybe on their social status. But the other side of it is there's also some, um, there were some reports that um, one of the uh, residential projects in which the North Korean government is, is trumpeting as a sign of its achievements in 2021, which is the, uh, the, the Comdoc uh, residential development in the mining area, which had a, had a disaster some time ago and which it's rebuilding, uh, that some of that, uh, the, the North Korean government or the press lifted, uh, listed a, a series of people that had contributed to, to the redevelopment in Comdoc, and that included individuals who are not particularly party people and who it's surmised were, were people with money like the Dongju. So, so that would indicate a small indication that their influence is, is, is not their influence, but their activities are still important in North Korea. So the private sector, however it's trans transmogrified in North Korea, uh, it, it, it still it hasn't been eradicated. But I think it really is a bit too early, as, as Deng Xiaoping said of the French Revolution, a little, a little bit too early to tell <coughs> how, how that's working out. Um, given, we do know though, considering the extent of marketization over the past 20 years, the extent of de facto privatization, the extent of the social structure being reorganized around both values uh, and, and wealth attached to those that have money, as opposed to those that have, have, uh, have political principles or Kim il -sung's principles, that it would be very unlikely that they would have just gone away. So uh, I think we'll, we'll be able to better answer the question in 2022, when we, uh, it looks like we, we may see some, some opening up of the trade, even if it's a bit, uh, uh, a, a bit sporadic. Um, I want to come back to the issue of agriculture and food. One of the questions that I, I, I can't answer, I can't answer all the questions that are that are raised in the uh, in the in the Q and in, in the Q and A, but I would say that in the 1990s, and, and I worked in North Korea throughout the 1990s, and I, I worked in every count, every province of the country, and I, I saw many pe young people starving and all sorts of things everywhere. People didn't die in the streets. Um, the, the image of a starv starvation that we, we, we see of people did coming into the streets and dying in big numbers, that didn't occur. People went home and died at home. And also, uh, so it, was, it, it wasn't hidden because of, particularly, but uh, at least after the first few years, but uh, they died at home. There wasn't a big dramatic 
large and so if if people are dying from starvation and malnutrition related disease um that will be happening again it's it's not going to be some big out you know uh, unlikely you can never say never unlikely in, in the streets also if we look at the figures which we in hindsight we have now very good figures on malnutrition on deaths in the 90s and in the 2000s what we find is that the mortality rate in north korea even including and I think that the U.S. Um, demographers who've worked through the uh, uh, have actually done the best research on this. The best figures show probably less than half a million excess deaths, which is enormous, uh, but still half a million. If we look at if we, even if we include those figures, and we 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 look at the um, at mortality and mortality rate since since the early 1990s, what we find is that even during the famine, that the mortality rate never uh, in North Korea was never higher uh, than in India, for example, in children, which what that means is that the mortality rate in children in India is normalized at high level from malnutrition. Uh, so, so, so again, what we will be seeing if we see increased deaths and more and, and high disease in North Korea is an increased uh, uh, would would be more likely to see a normalization of and uh, an increase of higher numbers which would would be more like what's happening what happens in india as a normal situation sadly uh, and therefore when the question is asked how is it that this can be happening it can be happening very easily because it happens in other countries where where, where high rates of related to malnutrition are are much more common than they are in north korea um, and, and that's a much more likely scenario if we're seeing starvation in different parts of the country, particularly in rural areas and among vulnerable people, to see just higher levels of deaths uh, than, than to see very um, dramatic pictures uh, of, 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 of large numbers of mass casualties. In terms of one of the questions asked is why after 2018, what was the relationship of sanctions to agriculture? Agriculture everywhere in the world, including in the United States, is completely dependent on oil, completely dependent on oil. Um, it doesn't matter if you're a poor country or you're a rich country. It's, it's for things like plastics, it's includes things for fertilizer production, for pesticides, for chemicals, and also, of course, you need machinery. Now, it's true, as Rudiger says, that there has been some movement towards gravity-fed irrigation, but if you can't get spare parts for your gravity-fed irrigation and all those are banned under sanctions, um, and if you're smuggling in oil, which you have to pay for, which comes at a premium price, even from China, it doesn't come free, uh, then that is, is uh, as the FAO has commented in all its reports until its last reports in 2019, when it was allowed to go in, that has an immediate effect on agriculture. And given that agriculture, um, depending on how you quantify it, you know, give or take, is 25 to 30 percent of the of the North Korean economy. And if you include the transport infrastructure that's necessary to distribute food, labor, plant, uh, plants, seeds, crops, you're talking about higher percentage, as in all poor economies, agriculture is you know, a bigger percentage, then if you've got sanctions which don't distinguish between the civilian and the military economy, then you will expect that they will hit the major sectors of the economy. And that's in fact what they did. So it's not, um, it's not rocket science, and we don't actually need sophisticated quantitative analysis to see that there is this relationship there. Sigrid Sig Heger says what would be the most effective actions the US could take uh, to aid the North Korean economy. My view is that perhaps uh, uh, is I would distinguish between the North Korean economy and the North Korean population in terms of food. Uh, my view is that it would be a, a decent gesture to suspend the 2017 sanctions. Uh, not, uh, not, not get rid of all the sanctions, but to suspend the sanctions that stop machinery and all machinery and, uh, and, uh, and, and products that are necessary for agriculture going into the country, short of going through a very complicated and convoluted exemption procedure, which doesn't uh, uh, allow for those to take place. The scale of the food gap is too big for NGOs to cope with. A million and a half tonnes of food short requires either governmental support from somewhere like China. And one of the reasons that China may not have given grain imports in 2021 is because it's, it may be concerned at home about the impact of COVID 
on its own agricultural sector. It's got large grain reserves, which is why it's been able to support North Korea in the past, but it will be planning for the future as every country is. And if COVID breaks out in its farming population, even though they, it's, it's less labor dependent than in North Korea, it will have to be thinking about keeping its own reserves for the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Um, Dr. Frank, I see your hand right now, but before I turn to you, I just want to kind of collate some of the more questions. We've come up on time, but I've been given the go ahead to take a little bit extra minutes, especially since this conversation is really um, going. I mean, we have so much so much depth in this conversation, and it's certainly really timely. What I want to, and again, Dr. Frank, feel free to, to add on to this, but I want us to kind of end on the geopolitical aspects of this. I mean, We've really brought um, out the human, human, the humanitarian element to all of this. And I think this is underlying a lot of the questions uh, in our Q&A. Um, Andrew Yaw um, uh, uh, brings up that uh, he's amazed that North Korea hasn't made any major appeal based on these food shortages. Um, how has it been able to get through these, for, these food shortages? But like more kind of in, in a broader sense, like is China addressing this food gap? to keep mass starvation from breaking out, to see the kinds of you know, uh, economic, I don't wanna say breakdown or, or the mass migration that we've seen in the past. Um, what other countries are gonna be getting involved in this um, from, a, from an interest perspective? Um, John Kim asks, um, how are COVID vaccines going? Are, is China, is Russia um, gonna be supplying them? Uh, what is North Korea's calculus when it comes to where it's maybe gonna be accepting vaccines? Again, this is kind of um, your, your supposition right now, but, um, uh, and then I, I also kind of have a question more broadly, and, and this has been undergirding a lot of the comments that you've you've made is, um, you know, given the, the changes of the economy in North Korea, the, the rise of this middle class, um, the, the, the severe agricultural issues, the, 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 the dominance of the state over the markets, um, how can we talk about sanctions now? It has the logic of sanctions necessarily changed both in terms of you know, uh, we, given the COVID situation and North Korea's closure of its borders, but also more broadly with geopolitics shifting, can we use sanctions um, in a way that's going to be as effective or, or as we think it's going to be effective as it was, say, two years ago or, or earlier, 2016, 17, when, when they really ramped up? So I'll, I'll, I'll turn it first to, to Dr. Frank. It's a lot of questions, but <laughs> take what you will. Yeah, on, on the sanctions, I think I already answered that. Um, if it turns out that Russia and China are going to ignore existing sanctions, then the whole sanction regime is dead and we just don't need to talk about it even because both have everything that North Korea needs. They don't need more economic partners. And that's, that's the end of, of the story. So uh, I'm pretty sure people in uh, DC will spend lots of time talking about sanctions because you know you kind of have to be busy and I un understand that. But yeah, it's kind of a waste of time uh, in terms of really being effective. Um, the point I wanted to make, and I'll try to be really brief, is on a very important question that has been raised. It's the relationship between the state and the economy. And um, as an economist of East Asia, I've always also been looking at North Korea through the lens of the East Asian development model kind of anticipating that they might be doing the same thing, you know, and uh, of course, South Korea is the obvious case for comparison. Very different, I understand, of course. But um, the one quote I have in my mind, uh, it's from a book by uh, Woo Jong-un on South Korea's economic development, is that the Chebol, she describes as private agents of public purpose. And I think this is I couldn't find the better expression. So these are private actors, but they act more or less 100% on behalf of the state, acted. There's this uh, curious example of the Gukje Chebol in the 1980s, where they kind of tried to go astray, and then the government made sure that they just go bankrupt. But all the others, at least under Park jong hee and also John nu Hwan, they basically did what the state told them to do. Look at what China is doing recently, how they were treating Jack Ma and Tencent and Alibaba, etc. They try to do the same thing. And the North Koreans, even though they will always deny that, they have been very, well, let's say, following very closely what the Chinese have been doing and what the South Koreans have been doing. And I think they just do the same thing. So when we say the state is trying to regain its dominance over the market and over the private, semi-private, quasi-private part of the economy, it doesn't necessarily mean that this is all going to go 
It's just the state just tries to, to have a more iron grip on them and make them do what the state, state wants them to do. Ironically, this means that for the uh, Donzu or the uh, middle class or however you like to call them, there is still a place in that system. It's not like they will be ripped of all their opportunities to be rich and influential and everything. It's just that they have to do this more in line with the demands of the state. I mean, they had to pay uh, fees before and now they have to pay them as well. But as long as the North Korean state manages to give these people an opportunity to benefit from the current system, more state, less market does not mean necessarily that the dynamics will be gone and that the Donja will turn into opponents of the regime. And um, the uh, South Koreans have done it successfully, Chinese have done it. So probably the North Koreans will be able to do the same thing. That's such a helpful intervention to think about comparatively, right? When you say things like import substitution, you say dependence on keeping, weight, like having a, a large, uh, large workforce where you can keep their their wages artificially low, right? These are all resident when we think about East Asian development models. It's a really helpful comparison, I think, for a lot of us um, going forward. Dr. Smith. Um, thank you very much. Um, on the issue, you, you raised the issue of sanctions and are they still useful or effective? All the sanctions literature, if you're a political scientist, most people will be aware of the, of the uh, of any such political economists that there's a, a huge library full of <laughs> sanctions literature. And what it shows, um, whether quantitative, using quantitative, historical, empirical, qualitative evidence, is that sanctions don't have a track record of achieving political objectives unless they're accompanied by war or, or by diplomacy. Uh, there's sort of unequivocal research findings on this. So when sanctions were expanded, and um, sanctions, UN, we're talking about universal sanctions because the US had sanctions on North Korea for a long time, but the Europeans for instance, never joined those until 2006. Universal san sanctions, which included China and Russia from 2006, first of all targeted the military and the defense sectors. Uh, 2016, 17, they were, they were broadened out. Um, there was never, it might seem strange to your listeners, but <laughs> your, your, your people tuning in, there has never been a log frame analysis a, 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 a document setting out internally in the United States or in the United Nations how A is supposed to achieve B, how sanctions are supposed to achieve denuclearization. It's really unusual for the UN because the UN loves log frame analysis. I don't know enough about the internal workings of the US government to know if they also do uh, log frame analysis and goals and achievements, but there has never been uh, and, and if I'm wrong, somebody will tell me, as I see there's some very important people from within the US government that are on this chat line. But to, to my knowledge, and I spent a long time in the States, uh, several years, and uh, working with the UN doesn't exist. Um, so there was never a plan, established plan, for how these sanctions were supposed to achieve outcomes in North Korea, achieve denuclearization. Secondly, there was never an impact assessment done either, but, and I talk about the US because the US was the main, particularly in the last few years has been the main uh, sponsor of, of the expansion of sanctions. There has never been an impact survey done. We have reasonably enough data to be able to do it of uh, what sanctions would do to the North Korean population, um, either by the UN or by the US. Uh, although uh, since the Iraq sanctions and the Haiti sanctions of the 1990s, which some of the people tuning in will, will remember or will have read about there was documented um, impact on, on mortality rates in children. The standing orders, standing operating procedures for sanctions committees are supposed to be that they are supposed to do regular impact uh, assessments. There has never been one done. So in answer to your question, the, how effective sanctions have been, well, nobody knows because we've got no criteria against which to judge effectivity apart from final denuclearization, which is a very big task, uh, a very big ask indeed. Uh, so that, that's one aspect. In terms of the relationship of China, the geopolitics, which you also mentioned, of, of course, China and Russia have become increasing, increasingly close over the last few years, partly in opposition to the United States. Uh, for me, I think it's more a transactional relationship than a, than a question of philosophical alignment. 
they're still they've got very major uh, tensions, uh, even though they're not at the fore uh, be between the two states as they've had historically. Um, in terms of the impact of that on the North Korean crisis, well, strategically, they're certainly not going to, I agree with Rudiger, uh, being, being in any way supportive of US uh, aims at, uh, at the Security Council uh, on North Korea in future. Um, but in terms of the aid that, what I sort of slightly disagree with, <laughs> with my esteemed colleague Rudiger, is that um, if we look historically, Russia hasn't really, uh, apart from during the Cold War, um, given that much to North Korea and given its economic crisis because of sanctions, I don't, my view is that's not going to, it's not going to follow up with very major aid. Um, and that China, uh, whereas it has, as I said, given a lot of grain aid in 2019, will also be considering um, carefully uh, whether or not North Korea is, is worth them uh, um, giving massive aid. And we have to remember, in fact, that Chinese goods going into North Korea are generally paid for at premium prices, especially smuggled oil, but also anything that goes into North Korea, the North Koreans pay above market prices for um, to, to, to go in. And this happens again in every sanctions episode, uh, whether in, in history is that, that, that sanctions smugglers don't do it for nothing, they do it because they get paid premium prices. So, so yes, the geopolitics have changed. Um, I'm not so sure that that's going to personally mean that North Koreans will, will, will benefit from that. And it takes us back to the issue again, of, is why, why hasn't the North Korean government called for more aid? Because frankly, it's a government that doesn't really care too much about the population, its priorities, regime change. And if, as is likely, North Koreans, as I mentioned earlier, are dying at home, and what we're seeing is uh, people dying earlier, prematurely, and women dying in childbirth, which will yeah. be increasing as well. Uh, that, that isn't sufficient for the North Korean government to be able to, uh, to, to alter a policy where it thinks it gains from having no access with the West. And also, finally, we mustn't underestimate the level of potential disarray within the North Korean leadership, which means it's difficult for it to change policies in a, in a proactive way. It means it's much easier for it to carry on with policies uh, which it's used before. And although, uh, again, this is not something that we can identify, nobody's got any information on the dynamics in the internal political leader, it is something we should be watching out for as a potential yeah. cause of external behaviour. Yeah. That's great. Well, wow. thank you. Thank you. This panel has been extremely helpful. I think one of the things that we can take away is the importance of thinking comparatively. What, do, what is, you know, it, when it comes to sanctions, when it comes to the way the state has muddled through its relationship to the economy. I think that's something that's, um, I think, a, a breath of fresh air in, in a lot of the ways that we talk about North Korea. Um, just for, there's a few other questions. Mark Tokola, Mac Manning, yours have been answered in the Q&A if you'd like to look. Um, a few others as well. Um, otherwise, I I'm, I'm just want to thank our panelists for their really um, important interventions, um, especially as we think about North Korea, as the, the situation really is becoming more severe with the COVID um, running, through the country, running through the country right now. Um, the program is going to be on, available online later for anybody who's interested. But again, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Frank. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for joining us. Um, and I hope to see you all soon. Thank you. <laughs>